Hi, you are listening to Baju Talk, a podcast for government services professionals. My name is Baska Sundram, and I will be sitting down with our government services leaders to share their stories, discuss their career, and learn all about their values and collective impact in our society. Today's guest is Jonathan Warren. Jonathan has extensive experience in communications and journalism. After five years as a reporter, commentator, and features editor for the Municipal Journal, in 2015, he became the first strategic communications officer for the District Councils Network. Prior to the MJ, he edited an online government property and public estate magazine and helped run communications and marketing for anti-poverty charity Elizabeth Finn Care. He began his career in online publishing for the public service professional and developed the Wired Gov service for the better digital repackaging and redistribution of central government press releases before founding a small business to government consultancy, which among others helped pioneer the first UK public sector reverse auction. So welcome Jonathan, the CEO of Localist to Bachi Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Jonathan, I think, you know, you're one of our special first week guests. So thank you so much. And uh, let's go back, Jonathan, and uh, talk a little bit about about you. Uh, where were you born, your high school and education? Yeah, well, I was, um, I was born in Carshalton Beaches in, in Surrey. Uh, my, my mother ran an antique shop. She's a, formerly been a nurse until she got married. And... Um, in the, back in those days, it was upon marriage, a nurse would traditionally um, become a housewife. That was the thing. But my mother was very restless. She uh, opened an antique shop. So I, I was I was the home birth in in Carlton Beaches. The the shop was called Knickknacks, and so uh, yeah, I've got very, uh, very 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 fond memories uh, of that time. There's a great photograph uh, as the home birth. You wouldn't guess very it these days of the doctors, the nurses all sat around my mother, all smoking a, a Peter Stuvason, <laughs> puffing away in their cigarettes, celebrating my, my arrival in the world. Oh, wow. That's, that's so memorable. And from Koshalton Beaches, did you did your schools and uh, education around the same area? Um, initially, but my, my story moved. My, my, my father uh, was a professional civil servant, and his main job was to relocate civil service government departments and agencies to other parts of the country so you probably guess what's coming next uh he was working for the health and safety executive and he moved them from southwark in london up to Bootle in merseyside uh, it was just this during the early 80s uh during time of great high unemployment and he subsequently went on to move other parts of government education um the Department for Health and Social Security. Um, so, um, so at the age of seven, I moved from the leafy Surrey countryside to uh, to, to, to Lancashire uh, on on the coast in a lovely town called Southport. Oh yes, yeah, Southport. That's nice. And uh, how long were you there in Southport before you moved again? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it was like, like a very pleasant four four years there. Uh, Made made firm friends with those. It's difficult for kids when they when 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 they when they when they move. Uh, uh, no, I enjoyed the change of culture, scenery. I developed an abiding love of Liverpool Football Club. Uh, the, the alternative was I wasn't going to survive the playground unless I I either opted for Liverpool or Everton. So I I, I made like a, a playground conversion to save my skin, and uh, it was good because th- those were the days when Liverpool, like under Klopp, were winning everything. So we uh, stayed in a lived in a small village called Burkdale, and I remember seeing people like Kenny Dalglish, my heroes, pop around in their Liverpool tracksuits to buy pints of milk on their morning jogs. It was that like, um, good thing. But when I was eleven, my father's job moved from Merseyside down to a, a role for the Department for Education. Uh, and uh, so we, we, we couldn't afford to move back to London then. So he moved to the West Country, to Bath, near where my uh, mother's family was from. So I did my GCSEs, A-levels in, in the beautiful uh, 
Georgian city of Bath. Wow, that's that's amazing. I think you know what behind all these travel, you you also had to experience that, as you rightly said, the beautiful landscapes of of, of England. That's amazing, and uh, and you did the GCSC, and from there the university and related studies from Bath mm. or. Yeah, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. My, my school wanted me to study history, and I, I guess I probably sh- should have done, but I very uh, uh, pernickety or gnarly uh, uh, in my, my A-level days. So I, 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 my, 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 my t- one of my mentors at school was Dr. Th- Fr- Thorne, Dr. Frank Thorne, uh, mm. very urbane, uh, uh, Latin teacher, beard, a, a suit that hadn't seen, no, from the, from the 60s, wide kipper ties, uh, but a huge, huge sense of integrity and and mischief. And he he said, Jonathan, you're, you're, you you know you I I can't see you surviving on a university campus. You need to expand your life. He said, why don't you um, apply to one of the London colleges? Try your luck there and uh, try to expand your life. So I so I applied to University College London. And from UCL, uh, what? How did you progress the career? What was your first job? I was given, offered a, a New Deal job. It was called sort of Gordon Brown's flagship um, welfare um, to work policy, and the job I got was working in a benefits agency, um, giving unemployed people or pensioners their their benefit checks and dealing with. Um, so it got, it got me to work in public services. Uh, I don't know, right, um, writing people's winter fuel checks, winter payment checks. Then I got uh, an exciting job working with uh, the, the, the benefit fraud team. So essentially assigning the, the investigators, the people to see, um, to check for fraudulent claims during the course of the week. Um, it wasn't inspiring. It was uh, a bit dead end. But I, um, uh, I put in touch with um, a, a company based in Stockport who were involved in the early days of online publishing. And they said, if you're willing to come to Stockport, um, for seven thousand pounds a year though you might find something exciting for you to do so it was this kind of chance break uh i took me back back to the northwest of england getting involved in in in, in publishing and online publishing um during the start of the dot-com era wow so that from then on from now 20 years in online publishing and uh, magazines and stuff jonathan so is it what brought you close to the anti-poverty charity, the Elizabeth Finke, or you had uh, little bit in, in between? So in between there, the, 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 the source publishing was interesting. We, um, you know, we covering all the base of the public service life gave me a good grounding in editorial, although not professional journalism. I sort of um, learning as I as I went, but um, on, on the online side, I did a de- um, struck up a, a deal with. Uh, the Central Office for Information. It doesn't exist anymore, but they were the people who bought advertising space and did publicity and press for central government. And they had this news polling service. It was uh, in the days of three and a half floppy disks. And you could get all government press department press releases from there if you were you know, the likes of Reuters or the BBC. And I said, well, what if I was to you know, take take a feed and to redistribute it for our readers in a way that adds value and lets allows there a bigger audience for government press releases. And I was applying for other you know, senior jobs in public sector comms and uh, business development, always coming second. And then an internal candidate would come along. And uh, Elizabeth Fincare, as they were, said, look, would you come in? You clearly have an interest in history. Would you look at our archives um, one day a week? I had nothing else going on. I said, yeah, I'll do so. And I did that. We got on BBC Breakfast, um, Telegraph, The Guardian, lots of broadsheets, sharing our message about the need to uh, signpost you know, people who were struggling for the first time in their lives, having to navigate the welfare and benefits system and all the rest of it. Um, and we won awards for our grant giving. And that, that's quite an interesting time. So I, I, I fell into charity communications completely um, without any design, but it was a very an enjoyable journey. And from then on, was it Municipal Journal? Yeah, I um, after, after Elizabeth Finn, I was uh, 
wanting to get more involved in actually writing bank comms. So um, I developed a, a business plan for a government property website. Um, the idea was good. The timing was lousy because it was a, um, just in the, the wake of the financial cra crash. And then if people cast their mind back to 2010 in the UK, uh, there we had an emergency budget, uh, austerity finances. And there wasn't, although I, I, I was very determined, I couldn't, it couldn't be made to work commercially. But my great good fortune, I was working with very good people at Hemming Group, who produced the Municipal Journal. I was writing a, a Whitehall column for them, about 400, 500 words about central government matters. And they said, well, look, uh, the, the property thing didn't work out. Would you mind um, being interested in being a like, staff journalist on a freelance basis? And if it works, it, you know, make it a full-time role. And this was you know, complete answer to my prayers, my the happiest days of my life from 2010 to 2015, working at the MJ. I still got great friends, colleagues, still work there now, and that camaraderie. And they gave me a training as a journalist. They helped me fight my imposter syndrome that um, I couldn't get away with this. And it was a, a, a very, very happy time in my life. That's brilliant. Is, is that how you entered from central government to local government and you continued with Localis from then or? Yeah, my, my, so my journey then, I sort of, uh, having our second child, Clara, um, was moving from uh, a, 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 our youngest from a damp basement flat in near Olympia in Hammersmith to Kingston. My, my wife works as a music teacher. We needed to be close to her school, couldn't be driving over the Hammersmith Bridge uh, uh, on, on, on a regular basis. So it made sense to be, to be removed. And I thought, well, I've, being sincere with my life, I, I probably do need a new start. Um, after five very happy years with the MJ, an opportunity came to work uh, managing public affairs and strategic communications for a local government interest group, the district council's network. So I thought, well, yeah, it's probably uh, time, 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 time to move, time, time to change. So I took that job on for a good sort of yeah, eight, 18 months. I helped them set up an all-party parliamentary group to give districts a, you know, who do a great job in local government a better voice in local government, helped try to professionalise their communications, events and other outputs. Um, during the course of this, I, <laughs> I found myself being um, the only um, member of staff working in their London office at the, at the local government association there. Uh, few <laughs> things going on. So it, it, I, I, I learned to resurrect my, my standalone spirit to keep things going. Um, but uh, ultimately, I, I wanted a new challenge and um, I was determining what, what this new challenge is going to look like. And I thought, well, I've got, just got to take the courage to go freelance com communications, see what happens. And I did after the first District Council's national conference, which was a great success. Uh, and but that that's my sort of my swan song. I moved on after that. Um, very good friend of mine I developed whilst working at the MJ um, was it like Liam Booth Smith, and we we talked about doing something together, maybe on the more cultural or artistic side. But he was now chief executive at the Carlis think tank, and he said, "Look, we I need some help putting. We've got a you know, vital report on national local in, national industrial strategy." got no time, effort or resources to communicate the findings, will you take on the job? And he offered me an extremely gen no, decent um, freelance rate to do this. And I felt a great deal of respect working with Liam. No, he, no, from a friend, working with him was proved to be a very good experience. And no, we had a great launch. We had the Express, Sky News, um, broad other broadcaster national covering the report. Um, it was, it was a good good experience, slightly tempered by the fact um, we launched the report in the morning to great fanfare. Um, tragically, there was the Westminster Bridge attack that same afternoon, just to give some the context for that. Um, and so we kept in touch with Liam. He offered me a, a full-time job as head of news and events for the Carlis. And uh, a very, very happy time I had working with Liam. We they had put out that I helped. Liam is a political strategic genius. It was great working with him. 
Um, it was no, fun. It was no great, great team to be working with. And you know, he produced more, like, more great reports, gave him good coverage, um, really enjoyed you know, upping the game in terms of how we were improving all the time. But um, Liam had a five-year plan for the Carlis, but he was so successful at what he was doing. He was coached by a bigger think tank to, to be a director for them. But before they could land him, uh, the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, then James Brokenshire, asked Liam to be his special advisor. These are offers you don't refuse. And so uh, no, Liam departed very quickly to be special advisor in government. And I stepped up to be the interim chief executive. Uh, life and experience has taught me if you're in that kind of position and you don't throw your hat in the ring, um, you, you'll probably regret it. So I put myself forward as a potential chief executive of the car this, um, arranged all the interviews, including my own, um, and had no the great good fortune to be uh, appointed the Carlos chief exec, I think, uh, start of July uh, 20, 2018, and I've been serving in that capacity ever since. You know, from your experience, you know, you know, local government or central government communications, what do you think are the top three or five or even the best news sources that you think it's recommended for us to keep an eye on what's happening in the market? Um, fake, fake, fake your question. In terms of uh, local government, you've got to rely on the trade press. The trade press do an incredibly you know, good job. They are um, they're plowing through to understand what's what's happening, not just in the candidacies, but in the wider context. So the MJ, the LG, the Municipal Journal, the MJ, LGC, the Local Government Chronicle, um, great source. Um, other other news sources on on the macroeconomic side um, you can't go wrong dipping into to, to the economists um, other things for getting other other views I, I I do like um picking up some of the the political um bulletins so red box times is red box is a good must read but also some of the more overtly political ones like labor red list or conservative home gives you good digest and understanding of, 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 of the day's proceedings, what, what's going to be ahead, what, what's shaping things politically on, 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 the national, on the national scale. So those are kind of the ones I, I stick to. And the rest of it is just a, a hodgepodge of you know, what, what, what you put through your feed, um, Twitter likes, subscription likes. Um, I think it's a, a good read, you know, like CapEx or... Um, unheard for more dissenting voices. With, uh, with, with the Social Value Act and other things, you know, everybody is now uh, moving close into social impact in the local economy. Mm. Did you find uh, uh, any kind of offshoots that's happening that, you know, from theory that we are seeing some genuine local economic development that's happening? Yeah, I think you know, we're doing a lot of very current work looking at how the local state should be preparing for renewal and recovery of place after you know, we after we've gone through the trough of the deepest economic recession in recorded history as uh, so what we're picking up on is increased levels of collaboration between private voluntary and public sector uh, my concern here is that experience history shows us it's not often possible to maintain such a spirit nerves fray energies fray uh, when the money goes, you no know, people tend to be have a narrower frame of um, reference and self and self interest. But at the moment, we're seeing a lot of very good selfless collaboration. What I want to ensure at the car list from our work is how can we maintain that? And I think through our work and social value, it touched on something that's been intriguing me for a good many years: the concept of humanitarian competition uh, as a think tank. You no, know, we. we we believe in you know, the power of markets to act for good um, in context, a mixed provision of how we deliver all, all, all nature of the services. But um, with social value and with other reports, I want to see how far we can extend humanitarian competition, seeing you know, what areas can deliver 
the best local outcomes because when people do, um, others are keen to learn from them, not in an envious way, but instead, look, how can we achieve as good results for our places, for our community, for our people as these are doing? What innovative ways of managing or dealing with the problem are they alighting upon? That's enabling them to create results that create value, happiness and well-being far exceeding what could be thought possible otherwise. So this is why I see um, the present crisis in terms of the Carlos's focus on community, the role of business, the role of the voluntary sector, the role of local government. How can we harness human potential to create graces for good? That's brilliant, uh, Jonathan. So looking as, as a concept, uh, Jonathan, I think, you know, collaboration, local economy, you know, self-sustained economy, it's, it's, it's such an important subject. But what do you think are the bottlenecks or some of the uh, stoppages that you're facing in, in making this happen? The civil service is, has an imperial legacy. Though the word civil servant comes from the days of the East India Company, where there's a different, differentiation between um, military servants and civil servants. Um, our report last year on improving central local relations. I'm a great believer all problems ultimately are interpersonal relationships. I think that's a Adler's philosophy to uh, the contemporary of Freud, that interpersonal. And what we find in this country is we put people in institutions um, where people become the, view, their view, the viewpoint of their institution rather than seeing a shared common humanity and finding easy, common, shared solutions to problems. You just see endless conflict, a rerunning of crises. Um, so I think, though, to some extent, how you know, the, um, the central government here has been constituted, how it sees other parts of the country as mini empires or part of a, a s s small parts of a bigger, bigger whole is sometimes the case. It's sometimes its mindset. Well, not, not to the case, it's... Uh, interpersonal relationships um so i you know in our work on improving this we i you know calling for a greater sense of respect and dignity between local leaders and those you know, central leaders and senior officials as a means of you know, to resolving some of these impasses the, 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 if you can resolve the personal you can often shift the cultural the organizational i feel between these local leaders and senior leaders in central government, is this public service delivery that's done by, say, outsourced service providers or you know, third sector, et cetera. So how do you think, you know, where do you think they fit in in this whole thing? Because you see local government, as you're trying to see, they try to do more and more themselves. And central government is, is, is kind of mandating to a certain extent to outsource. In between, you have this outsourced service providers, whether private or third sector stuck in the middle. Uh, what advice would you give them? In 2010 was to, it, 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 obviously a natural result to a squeezing, quite harsh squeezing of, of, of budgets for local public services. Things became very transactional. Um, bring the lawyers in. Um, let's tie you down to the last bean. Um, that, it's always down to relationships. They're good suppliers, value good relationships. Um, this has always been true. Um, so how I, I, I see this work is, it, what's the ultimate outcome? What, start from the outcome. You want good public services delivered in place. What do I need to do so? I, I might have a budget to work with, a list of options of going about this. I you know, do it, run this as a public service mutual. I could go to outsource. I could you know, see if there's a, uh, a community way of um, you know, do, do, doing this examine all the options, see what's most appropriate for place, never rule anything out. I'm a great believer in mixed provision and appropriate provision. Um, I'll, I'll work on why we created the Community Value Charter for Social Value is because you know, the sense that, that services are delivered um, for people, but sometimes you know, they're not really considered in the, in, in the equation. You're, you're, a public service is something that's done to you rather than something as a resident or a public, or public as a citizen, no, you, you have any choice over how, why, or when it is delivered. So, um, so I say, no, um, no keep options. I think maybe coming from this crisis, I think there's a need to be 
be bolder at looking at what uh, a, a full um, wider provision for public services could be. Um, and um, the, the answer isn't always outsourcing, it's not always insourcing. I think it's you no know, let um, commissioners of public services make the, make the best decisions. Um, but no, the, let's do that in a, in a way that's founded on an ethos of respect, openness, and nurturing good relationships. And I think it's always the case, you know, those providers who can have a community base, something at stake for the community in the delivery of public services, naturally get more loyalty um, or understanding and empathy. And that you know, helps maintain business, extend contracts, all the things down the line. So you know, good suppliers know what to do. Good commissioners know, ought to know how to weed, weed out, um, pluck, the best service, the best providers um, open to them. What do you think are the right forums to reach out to local government leaders to build relationship from your opinion? I say un understand what part of local government you want to speak to. It's not a single cohesive. Um, we've got you've got a very fractured um, landscape for local government. Uh, some say it's complex. I say understand complexity, manage complexity. Um, so no, if, if your business focus or interest is more of the bigger cities, well, talk to talk to the core cities, talk to the M9 combined authorities, um, understand their needs. Um, similar for non-metropolitan England, um, speak to the umbrella bodies, the county councils network, the district councils network, uh, don't undermine the value of parish council. Speak to now. They're very open and innovative organisations. So understand your market, understand the key policy organisations um, in your field. And when it comes to forming relations with individual councils or groups of, um, just know that I just be very open in in, in your intentions and and, uh, and it's in, sincere in your communications and commitment. Um, and see 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 what happens. I, I the local government has survived the biggest cutbacks, far bigger than the health service or most other parts of the public service have had to cut because their leaders are open to ideas for innovation. Um, I say the rider to that is yes, local government is open to conversations, but do guard their time as a precious resource come with fully and if you have a proposition make it a short proposition you can communicate completely in say 15 minutes um and as 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 a briefing so it can be readily understood and then further dis disseminated um amongst the council you're, you're trying you're trying to talk with oh that's great and the and the sources that you recommended like LGC and MJ mm. is, is the sources that's kind of give you a more understanding of the marketplace and also the stakeholders in those particular councils, Jonathan? Yeah, no, yeah it's, it's, good, it's good to follow the MJ and the LGC. Um, probably the new source I should have given, localgov.co.uk, which is great content. It's a free free newsletter. Um, that's what I've always followed the local governments in those sort of purposes too. But yes, no, following the, the main trade titles, the MJ, the LGC, that will give you a good day-to-day, week-to-week understanding of what's, move, of what's moving and shaking in the sector. That's brilliant. And uh, regarding the community value charters, you're 100% right, I think. Uh, the services is, is procured on behalf of the end user. But mm. you know what, as an end user, you're not even aware what public services is being run by who. Mm. So uh, is there any way that as a citizen or as an end user, I know in my local authority, X and Y services are, are run by this company or it's done by the council, etc. Do we have like a checklist that the councils do or is it something confidential that it's, it's about, you know, you cannot access? Um, you have an ability to see all spending data above £500. How much is spent on, say, facilities management, telecoms, you know, who provides it, um, rather than having to navigate through a lot of machine-read data or worse PDFs? Um, it, 
it, it, it shouldn't be a, a huge burden either. I'm not, they, essentially, it's very easy is it, from the outside to say, oh, X council must do this, that, and the other. It, it's a resource implication. But I'm sure you know, we, we, we do need a better system for transparency on all forms of public expenditure. Maybe having a more local, localised version of the Public Accounts Committee would be a good way of seeing through that, having local people with business experience um, and forensic ability to dive through, get, to get answers might, might, might be a good, good way of doing this. Um, Jonathan, the, if you look about the locally led economic development, um, Jonathan, I mean, like as a, as a local supplier, you know, how do you think local councils encourage local suppliers to be part of the supply chain? And what do you think are the barriers that they're facing and how do you think we can break those barriers? Um, I think this is an argument that's been waged in, in recent years. Now, people cite the Preston model, how Preston and Lancashire made a conscious effort through its procurement rules to support local providers, local economy, local food suppliers, and all the rest of it. Um, I think that I, I think that's a, that's a good thing, but I would temper that by saying we know um, we know the benefits, but I don't think we understand the costs of that. Um, but living in an age, the age of hyper-globalisation is over, we're looking at national self-sufficiency, got Brexit down the line, further national sovereignty, um, local self-sufficiency will be important. Um, I just would say, look, um, temper that with it. No, we need an open market. We can't go back to the beggar my neighbour approach, which, um, which characterised the 1920s on a on the local government scale, no, councils have to be open to choice. Um, but you know, it's always within the rules or ambit of procurement to um, use things like social value or even under the old OGU methods for under the European framework for procurement um, to, you know, to to, to, to um, show local favouritism where where there's a, a clear clear advantage. Um, so I think we, we, we will see more of that by I would argue against you no know, this um entrenching local monopolies um or cartels cartels everywhere are bad regardless of whether they're local regional or central let's um get, they try and keep things as open as we can whilst you no know, protecting if needs be vital local suppliers and local economic anchors that's great Jonathan and uh... Touching about social value, Jonathan, I mean, like, you know, recently, you know, the social value as a score for local government tenders, it's 15 percent or sometimes it's even higher for companies who are tendering for local government contracts to serve for the local economy. Um, as, a, as a service provider, you know, who's already been hit with apprenticeship levy, who's been lit with mandatory pensions, living wage, and also kind of... Uh, getting like 15% on top of social value. As you rightly said, there is no structured, approved social value metrics around. Do you think this will be sustainable for the industry? Um, so my main concern here is uh, having sort of been on the other side, tendering for, for public service contracts. Um, now if you're a small company, you don't have bid resource. You don't have teams of people responding to tenders, tracking things, um, knock them out, out of the park. Um, and in terms of sustainability, um, the, the ability for the SME to, um, you know, to deliver or offer what, what a large corporate can, um, you know, is, is naturally you know, vastly, vastly reduced. So um, I think that social value should encourage a level playing field. Um, and um, SMEs and their value to the supply chain should be you know, should be should be recognised for for that. Increasingly, as we're looking for COVID renewal and recovery, I think it will will need new relationships between large suppliers and small and, and their small and the smaller subcontractors and suppliers, and new imaginative ways um, for them them to work together on the basis that. Um, uh, that for all local authorities, all local authorities always say the same thing. You wouldn't believe how many SMEs we've got as a proportion of our businesses. And it's always the same answer. No, I'm not surprised. It's just a, a general rule of life you, you don't think about until you look. And then it's, a, it's just a rule of life. So, yeah, we've got to protect the SMEs 
um, not make contracting over over burdensome for them. Um, and we still want the benefits of social value, but not at the expense of squashing uh, innovative value valued uh, small local businesses. That's hundred percent right, Jonathan. Because on one end, you know, we have to encourage SMEs, but on the other end, unlike the major service providers, they will not be able to demonstrate social value or mm -hmm. withstand the cost pressures or even the bidding costs to do that. Mm -hmm. so it's just strike a balance. What that meant is the ethos will say it's local government, local spend predominantly goes to local suppliers, but structurally, the way project is structured, it it normally lands up to the bigger service providers. But mm -hmm. you're right, I think it's a, it's a journey there, and let's see how the balance is being struck. Mm -hmm. With COVID crisis, from your experience, how did the local government manage their response? And did you hear any inspiring stories or any shout outs? I'd probably limit my remarks to, you know, we've seen a centralised top-down approach to managing the crisis. It's unknown territory um, as far as, the, although the contingency plans at national level were in store for a flu, we didn't imagine or understand what the nature of this this threat until it was upon us. Um, it hasn't. It's, it's, it's exposed many failings in how the centre works with localities. I think not using the latent power, potential knowledge of local government and the local state to track and test, track and trace um, it was a lost opportunity. Um, um, the, the use of local resilience forums hasn't been good. No, we always, no, I, I always thought from uh, but taking interest in civil contingencies from the, the end of the Cold War, we have no, we know what to do when the nuclear bomb hit. We know what to happen, what to do, what's put in place when a, when a, when a pandemic um, occurred. We had examples of SARS um, to warn us, but clearly and, and spinefully, but clearly not enough. So I haven't been. Um, Inspired by by the by the nature of how central governments work with <coughs> bless me local government. Um, in terms of inspiring stories, I think um, it's good to see that Tom Rewarden from Leeds has been you know, recruited into the, the, the test tr track and trace um, of operation. Essentially, local government works in the dark. Um, the benefits it's brought, like providing the business loan grants to many companies um, that won't get a lot of, a lot of praise, but it, but it should do. And also, that, that I'd be very impressed at the, the number of, um, as, a, as a localist, um, bottom-up grassroots community initiatives, which haven't required central government or the, the man in charge to tell them what to do. Ordinary people, seemingly ordinary people, working together, collaborating, in villages, hamlets, um, small towns, um, to create services to protect vulnerable people um, using very innovative means, as you've got to, in, in given the enforcement of social distancing and doing great heart and passion. There's a, um, I, I'm quite inspired looking at um, the National Association for Local Councils um, case studies. It's got like, th hundreds and hundreds of examples of actual proof of communities of individuals coming together to um, care for the most vulnerable people with heart, with passion, with wisdom. Um, so yeah, I, I you know, come to think of it, I have been very inspired by examples of grassroots action. That's brilliant, uh, Jonathan. And what's the source again, Jonathan, where there are lots of case studies? Um, the NALC, the National Association for Local Councils, they've got sort of an up, they update their list of local case studies from all, no, really small towns, villages, all across England. Um, uh, literally hundreds of examples. Until now, we have we had some very thought-provoking conversation. Jonathan, let's for the next last 15 minutes, we'll just uh, have some uh, rapid fire fun questions just to know a little bit more about you. So we are loosen up a bit. So, uh, what trait do you really like the more about yourself? Um, perseverance. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trait that only comes through age, but I think that 
sometimes perseverance is, is victory. Sometimes not being defeated is victory or standing up again after you've been be being failed. So no perseverance is I I'm a, a, on the negative side, I could vague obstinate, but perseverance if you're fighting with heart for a cause, a people or a community or something you believe in. No perseverance is victory. It's uh, the ability to endure, the ability to transform yourself during that that process of enduring. So yeah, perseverance for me. Ah, that's brilliant. Hundred percent. I think hearing your journey so far, you know, you have you have you have been an icon for perseverance, definitely, Jonathan. So, hundred percent. So, um, can you comfortably eat in a restaurant by yourself, or maybe go to movie yourself? Um, well, I have to as business takes me away from the family from town. Um, I think anthropologically, we're we're social animals, which is why this pandemic is such a disaster. We are commensal. We eat at tables. Well, that's our instinct. They are imprinted in our hunter-gatherer DNA and before then. Um, eating is a communal, a shared gesture. But I'm a, um, I, I can. I do quite like eating by myself sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, the only way I'll get what I want for my own pure selfish reasons. If I want uh, large haddock and chips um, in, in town, uh, my, 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 is it, my wife's not a big, such a big fan. I will take myself to the Laughing Halibut in Strutton Ground, Westminster, order myself a large haddock and chips with a, um, a, a roll of butter but, butter on the side and think, you know, and, and cope with it okay. And also if it's very busy, you might you might um, uh, have to share your table with, with someone, which is good. You get to meet interesting folk. A while ago, I met a guy who was... Um, um, restores antique antique violins and bizarrely we had a had an acquaintance in common which you you, you would never guess um going to a chippy for selfish greasy reasons <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant i think next time you know when we meet you might need to take me over to the same place for haddock and chips and let's do it. <laughs> so uh, uh let's do this uh, you already touched this maybe we'll so what random stranger has had the biggest impact on your life um, random stranger. Um, I'm not a great believer in random strangers. I um, was going through uh, probably Vieta Shroff. She's a uh, five foot nothing sort of Indian Parsi, um, works as a relationships counsellor. Um, I met her, I was, my, my first marriage was going through a very traumatic breakdown um, about 20 years ago. My first wife came from California and after 9 11, she didn't want to live in England and I wasn't able or willing to up sticks go to the states and uh maybe uh i was going through a great personal crisis and uh Vieta is married to one of my father's close friends um lovely lovely yorkshireman called david oliver and i met, met Vieta for sort of, um counseling therapy and uh, you taught me a lot about myself but she uh, she taught me about buddhism um and i thought well this is quite interesting uh, she, she's a Nichiren Buddhist, uh, which is about chanting Namyo Horenge Kyo. The, the principle is you summon up your, your Buddha nature within by chanting Namyo Horenge Kyo. And I, uh, I had a, she, she said, look, she gave me a card, say, just chant this, for your homework after this, just chant it for five minutes in the evening, see what happens. And cut a long story short, I went out, got very drunk, came home, um, to when I lived in Brent Cross. I was mugged 50 yards away from my home. I took out my Nokia, my wallet. I chanted Namio Hirenge Kyo in my head. I think I might have done it out loud. And my um, assailant had a change of mind. So I was summoning up a great deal of inner energy. And he gave me back my phone, which had fallen to the floor and broken into three pieces. And he gave me my wallet back. And I thought, thank you, Vieta, but this is all wishy-washy, oriental mystic stuff. I'm the most English person you could meet. This isn't for me, but out, because I'm a polite, hypocritical English person, I went to her Buddhist discussion meeting above a uh, nice drink in Streatham and they said, no, shared my experience and left that be. But Vieta's a good friend and we caught up for coffee every couple of months until she said on New Year's Eve 2004, you're a nice gentleman and all that, John, but, you know, you've got to grow some 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 spiritual balls. And she gave me a, a challenge, you know, um, chant this Namio Hirenge Kyo um, for a fortnight, for 15 minutes in the morning to and 15 minutes in the evening to appreciate my life, no matter what I'm going through. And at that time, I was going through you know, quite a lot um, 
post-divorce. And um, uh, it, it changed. I, I, I discovered an inner perseverance I didn't know I had. And uh, so from a, a, a random meeting with Vieta, I think the content, yeah, I, um, so I just happened to see my dad was in Victoria Station um, having dinner with Vieta and David. It turned into um, counselling sessions, which you know, were useful, but in terms, you know, in, into my, my greatest treasure, which is you know, an understanding that myself, you, and everyone has a huge reservoir of courage, compassion, wisdom, and vitality you can tap into at any moment and you can transform any situation, no matter how hard, difficult, um, in an instant. So what was the best year of your life and why? Um, probably 2010. It's the year I got married to my wife, Kerry, and I started working for the MJ. And you know, I thought um, it was, it was a, and what was remarkable about that year it wasn't an easy year. There are many challenges to be overcome, but um, you know, I was able to, you know, well, I needed to, to dig deep to find answers, solutions, and to, to take my life up a level. So that's, you know, 2010 is, a, is an, 10 years ago, an immediate answer. Wow, that's great. And if if I ask you a little one, the seven, one, seven year and four year old about daddy for reference, what do you think they would say? Um, I'm not sure what they'd say. I mean, have to have <laughs> may have to get them in to interrogate them. I don't know. I think um, I hope they say they dad's fun, dad shares, shares their interests. My, my son's a great history addict. Um, during lockdown, get so concerned about the amount of TV they're watching under all without your control. Oh um, he's like watching this series, Horrible Histories, and he's seen it three, three times already. So, um, so I guess I, I, I hope, I hope they say that I, I was a listening dad, an interested dad. Yeah, that's nice. And maybe you can ask tonight and let me know tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I will. It might not be what I want to hear. That's what we learn in journalism. You ask a question, you don't <laughs> get the answer you want. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. My, my children are big fans of horrible histories as well. So let's just do that. So, so far, I think, who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Well, I mentioned Fiesta Schroff. She was very influential. My, um, my father's been um, influential. Um, he told me upon pain of death, I wasn't to work for the civil service. Otherwise, he'd be very disappointed. Um, in respect, that maybe wasn't the best decision. It might have been uh, might, an, an interesting move on my part. But no, my, that has been very important. My mother, too. My um, mother gave me an abiding love of literature. Um, now, I said my most prized book is that rare collection of T.S. Eliot, whose poetry I deeply um, admire and I uh, I'm obsessed with. She gave me my first copy of T.S. Eliot's poems, and uh, she left, she left school at fifteen to work um, in a in a in, in a department store in Bristol. My my my, my parents um, also. You always must have a great sense of debt, debt and gratitude to your parents. You realise this when you're a parent yourself, even though you might not see it at the time. That's great. You're so blessed with so many relationships. So uh, what's one kind or thoughtful thing someone did to you recently? Probably, you know, my, my, my final year of university, my, one of my sort of lecturers said after a couple of very, very dismal years, um, uh, I think advice is very good when it's short. He does uh, say that do yourself some justice and that um, it's amazing. Sometimes the guidance advice, the shorter the better. It's just got to, to, to pierce the heart, to pierce one's, one's mm -hmm. carapace of arrogance in my part. And anger. Um, so that's why you know, um, there's David Griffiths. He has said, said a, a few words. Uh, my son, I, I sometimes think of that when I'm struggling or um, letting myself fall into the problems of my own making. You always make your own problems in life as well as your own opportunities. So do yourself some justice is a, is a phrase that comes back. That's a brilliant advice. I was planning to ask you what's the best piece of advice you ever received. I think you already answered that question. Two for one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, what would you do if you were the last person on this planet Earth? 
Um, I'd be very lonely. I wouldn't know what to do. I'd um, I chant. I chant Namu um, Harenge Kyo. That's nice. For, for for the happiness of myself. That this is actually if you're the last person. There's still there's still life. I I chant for life, for abundance of life. So what's the courageous thing you have ever done so far? When I lived in Hammersmith, I reached out after 2015 to the mayor of Hammersmith to ask if they put on a, um, if Hammersmith and Fulham would have a, a peace day, an international peace day. And it involved me having a couple of conversations with the mayor, the policy advisors, waiting a year. But eventually they did have a youth-led celebration of peace in the centre of Hammersmith in Lyric Square. And that was, as yes, I say, that was courageous. I, so I didn't know what the result would be. I didn't know if we, I, I was coming from a s- s- spirit of sincerity, but you were never sure when you're so being, doing something so open hearted, whether well, my fear is you just look like a, like a fool or an idiot or a simpleton. So I think that anything I tried, acted with, with sincerity, I regard as courageous action. I probably, the lesson for my life is be more sincere, be, be afraid of you know, being taken for a simpleton more. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. 100%. That's, that's 100% courageous, Jonathan. And uh, share one funniest or one silliest, wackiest status you have put on social media recently. My son, on, on the first day of lockdown, I, I tried to work from our offices for as long as I could. Um, my son was busy in, in, in the kitchen. He came up with this very touching picture. To daddy, I hope you are, you're okay. Love, <laughs> uh, kiss, cuddle, kiss, cuddle. So I think that's the most emotive and touching and personal thing I put on social media in a file. That's beautiful, definitely. It's on that's so beautiful. So uh, that's great, Jonathan. So what's next for you? Um, next is continuing to deliver quality, timely and value-creating research to help the recovery process. We've got a report out on community buildings and assets and protecting Social, our vital social infrastructure coming up soon, doing work with local authorities to help their thinking about recovery in the medium term, what this might mean for young people. I'm particularly concerned about young people, the risk of a lost generation uh, of, through unemployment. So that's kind of our main thing, though, keeping a focus on community, on place, on what creates value, business, culture, education. Um, so that's what's going to keep me working through these uh, uh, long, long, hot summer nights, Basker. Wow, that looks like a very busy schedule for you, Jonathan. I mean, like, that's great. And is there any part of your life or career that we haven't touched? Maybe we could spend, like, the last few minutes looking at them, Jonathan? Anything? No, I think not. If I, um, as I said, I was a, a great believer in, in the power of perseverance. Um and you know, in, in, in treasuring life, you know, your, your, your life experience, uh, the, the, the nature of time changes as you get older. But even my younger colleagues noticing under lockdown how sort of time takes on its true nature, which is quite, quite, quite illusory. I always believe you know, that the greatest you know, in, in the power of the present moment and the power of making a big bow or determination. Um, so you know, in that sense, you know, the best years are always to come. You can always create a, a greater, a brighter future, um, starting from this moment now. Brilliant. I think that's super positive, Jonathan, super positive. So I really wish you all the very best, all the success, good health and happiness in everything yeah. you do, Jonathan. And it's really been a privilege to have you with the, within the first week of what we are trying to do here. Thank you so much for all your love and support. Please do look after yourself. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, Jonathan. Thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to talk with love to your family. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Please do visit bachi.com forward slash podcast to this specific episode link to everything that was mentioned in this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, review and share Bachi Talk podcast with your loved ones. We will see you at the next episode with another special guest. Until then, It's Basker Syndrome from Bachu signing off.